Yes, because of the massive increase in BPI trust fees for their investment funds, I have decided to move my future investments out of BPI. Among the many alternatives, I'll discuss which bank I actually chose as my new home for my investments. And I'm not gonna lie, it hasn't been easy, it's been tedious to be opening a new account, going through all the paperwork, and so on and so forth. Has this been all worthwhile just to avoid BPI's trust fees? This is what we'll look to cover, so let's go! But before anything, if you are new to this channel, Hi, I'm Mark. It's nice to meet you. In this channel, I cover quite a bit about lifestyle, but I mostly talk about business and investments. So let's backtrack a little. I wanted to summarize the key points that we covered in the last few videos. So in February, BPI announced that they are increasing their trust fees across all their UITFs or Unit Investment Trust Funds. Now, the specific fund that we've zoned into is the BPI US Equity Feeder Fund, which is tracking the S&P 500. This fund used to have a trust fee of 0.75% per annum. This year, BPI has doubled this to 1.5%. This led me to finding alternatives from BPI's competitors. So I also found similar S&P 500 funds from BDO, Metro Bank, RCBC, and East West Bank. Now, it could have been easy to find my new home for investments if we were just looking at the trust fees that the banks are charging. But it wasn't as easy as that. We had to factor in the minimum amount to start the investment and also more importantly, the minimum amount that you would need each time that you would reinvest in these investment funds. After doing a lot of number crunching in the second video, we found two suitable alternatives that were the best of breed. So the first of these would be RCBC. Their trust fee was at 0.75% per annum while the minimum investment to start an account is at $200, and each time that you needed to top up and reinvest, you only needed $100. And next to RCBC, with a similar return of investment over the course of 10 years of investing in the S&P 500, we have the investment fund from East West Bank. East West Bank's trust fee is at 0.5%. Their minimum investment is however higher at $500, and for subsequent top ups, their minimum investment is at $200. So at this point, I'm choosing between RCBC and East West Bank as the new home of my investments. Let me walk you through my decision process in a little bit, but I first wanted to clarify since there seems to be a little misunderstanding from my original video on this. So I've shared with you that I'm moving my investment from BPI to one of these banks. And some of you commented, why are you doing that? Don't you know that once you move your investment, you will start at zero? Well, yes, I know that. What I actually mean by moving my investments would be more for my future investments, meaning that for the most part, my BPI investments will stay put. I mean, I don't really have a choice. Even with the trust fee doubling, I can't really exit my investments there and put it in a new home. Again, understanding that I would be restarting the whole investment process. So I wanted to clarify what I mean by moving is not so much the old funds, but really more for my future investments. So I wanted to clarify that before we move on. So having done my homework, mostly through the websites, I wanted to, of course, validate the information first. I was actually looking to find the information about how much it would take to start a US dollar savings account with RCBC and East West Bank. And I also had a few clarifications that I wanted to cover. So for the selection process, I did what I thought would be the most convenient thing to do, would be to call up the hotlines of each bank. But I was actually quite surprised that when I called up the banks, the customer service attendants didn't really seem to know what I was talking about when I asked them about these investments, UITFs. They thought that I was asking about insurance. I tried to ask further, but the conversation didn't really go anywhere. It ended up with the customer service attendant telling me to just go to the branch. So for this part, I was actually disappointed. But anyway, the banks were within walking distance from my place, so it wasn't too much of a problem. So I took about a five minute stroll, found the nearest RCBC in BGC that was near my place. Walking into the bank, I inquired with one of the personnel there, and unfortunately, the person in charge of investments or the person who had the knowledge was not in. It was lunchtime, I think. So she told me that she couldn't answer my questions and she promised me that the person in charge will contact me. So again, that was disappointing. 
So from RCBC, I walked another 5 minutes to the nearest East-West Bank that I could find. This time, it was a more satisfying experience. I was able to talk to the relationship manager and she was able to tell me about the process of opening an account. For East-West Bank, I needed to open a US dollar savings account. The minimum to open this account would be $200. So I had the information that I needed from East-West Bank. It was actually two days later when RCBC contacted me, letting me know that if I had any questions that I could ask them via Viber. Until about this day, Two to three weeks later, I still haven't heard back from RCBC. But anyway, looking through the details of their website, I actually needed a minimum of $500 and to maintain this $500 as the average daily balance. So that's $200 for East West Bank and $500 for RCBC. Now to start the UITF with East West Bank, it's at $500. And with RCBC, it's $200. So for both these banks, I would need $700 to get started. But I went with East West Bank, even if their subsequent top up of $200 is much higher than RCBC's $100. For East West Bank, I saw that this would be more hardworking. I only needed to keep $200 in the account, meaning that that $200 would be the one that is low interest earning. I thought that putting in my money, $500, into the UITF versus RCBC, where in the $500 would just sit in the savings account. I ultimately went with East West Bank as my choice. And yes, it did help that they were better prepared in answering my questions when I inquired with them. So now that my choice was made, the hard work, the tedious part actually started. So I had to withdraw $700 from my BPI US dollar savings account. The thing with withdrawing in a foreign currency is that you have to do this in a branch. We can't use our ATMs for this. And even though I am under preferred banking in BPI, I still had to wait those 30 minutes to be able to queue and get my money. So I did this all within the next few days. Before I could invest in a UATF, I of course had to open my US dollar savings account under East West Bank. It actually took me about 3 hours to be able to open that bank account. I haven't opened an account in a while now so I've forgotten how tedious it could get. Uh, you have to provide your proof of income your billing address, uh, do you live near, all of these things. So after having opened my account, I was surprised that East West Bank actually gave me a passbook. So apparently, so they are still working with a passbook for their US dollar savings account. After having opened my savings account, I went through the usual risk assessment profile, answering questions on your knowledge about investments and how much risk that you're willing to take. In total, that was actually somewhere between three to four hours. This was done on Monday, April 15th. So again, I opened my account and my request to invest in a UATF through the trust department. It actually took one whole week before the trust department contacted me, getting my confirmation. So they emailed me in the morning, asking me to confirm so i quickly replied with a yes and before the end of the business day i got an email again in the afternoon that i was now invested in the s p 500 fund so again more or less that opening process took about three to four hours and the wait time was a little over a week what we've talked about in this channel is about investing regularly so that was naturally my next question. How would I reinvest in the fund when I want to? Based on that previous video, I'm planning to do this every two months or a little over 70 days. I think I'm able to save for the $200 between two to three months each time. So the process for having to reinvest is to go to the branch again and sign a request to deduct from your account and invest the said amount. If you haven't watched my previous videos before, I was doing this via BPI Mobile or BPI Online. I was practically investing daily. So $1 every day, why do that? This would be the principle of lowering your average cost since you're not really looking to time the market. You are just there investing regularly in small increments. So unfortunately for East West Bank, I'm not able to do this online. I actually tried to enroll my US dollar savings account online, but I keep getting an error. The website, their portal seems to be a little clunky. It won't be as easy as BPI wherein you can just do it all online. So I guess the question now is, is this all worthwhile? I would say like most things, it would really depend on you, your personal situation. For me, I think it's worthwhile. 
Again, BPI's 1.5% is just too big for me to keep giving BPI my money. Like I've mentioned in my previous videos, for this BPI US Equity Feeder Fund, I have at least $15,000 there. $15,000 at 1.5% each year, that's about that's about $225 each year. So in peso value, depends on when you're watching this, that's about 13 to 15,000 pesos that I would be giving BPI just to have my money set there. So if I intend to invest another $15,000 over the course of many, many years, that amount would only be $75 with East West Bank. So that's a large comparison. So for me personally, it's worthwhile. I mean, the branch of East West Bank is also not too far. So that's an added convenience. But I do understand if you find having to go to the bank, having to open a new account, the hassle of waiting and not being able to do this online. I understand if you think it's not going to be worth it, if the hassle, if all that is really worth the extra 1% that BPI is charging you. So what do you think? Again, personally for me, it's worthwhile because I intend to invest in the long run. And in the long run, those charges will bulk up as you invest more. Are you choosing BPI despite their higher trust fees versus their competition? If you've liked this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching, guys, and happy investing.